All right, so today I wanted to talk about um, protein. This is a, this is a, can be kind of an in-depth look at protein. I'm going to try to answer uh, several questions. I put them here, A, B, C, D, E. So we're going to try to go over these questions. Like, what is protein? Anyways, um, what is the purpose of protein? Uh, how much protein do I really need? Can I eat too much protein? And then what are the best sources of protein? So when you're choosing foods and things like that, what are the best ones to pick? Um, now, kind of on a tangent, it's actually the title, because um, I do, I want to kind of talk about this a little bit, is um, I'm going to, at the end of this, I'm going to try to explain why I really like uh, essential amino acids when it comes to pro supplements, not necessarily whole foods. Whole foods are always going to be best, but when it comes to like supplements, like a lot of people are taking like protein powders and protein shakes and protein bars and things like that. Um, I tend to prefer what are called essential amino acids. I brought some here to kind of show you, you know, what they look like. Uh, this is this company. I like uh, Nutribio. Um, they have a product that's in the, the white jug here. It's called EAA, which stands for Essential Amino Acids. And um, I like this particular company for a few reasons. I won't go into that now. But one thing I like about this product is that they're all plant-based, which is hard to find. A lot of the products like this are not plant-based. They're, these are amino acids. They're literally, believe this or not, they're being extracted from things like feathers and uh, byproduct from animal slaughter. So like high hair, bone, it's just kind of gross. Uh, Nutribio makes all of their amino acids from plants, so they're all plant-based. Uh, they, they also like that these are not, um, another kind of difficult thing to find, these are not made with um, uh, like uh, sucralose and artificial sweeteners or sugar, but they use stevia, and it's all, you know, all natural. So I, I like this particular product. That's, those are a couple of reasons why. So I'll, but I'll get to specifically why, and specifically in the context of health and fat loss, and I'll explain what I mean about that in a second, but I wanna first try to answer some of these other questions, because I think that will help what I'm about to say about these make a little bit more sense. So let's start with the first question, which is, uh, what is protein? Because this is one, believe it or not, that's kind of confusing for many people, because uh, you know, take uh, people who are vegetarian or vegan, um, a lot of times when they're eating only plant foods, other people who are really big about protein, in their head, they're like, there's something important about protein. So like, you know, the minute they hear someone is doing like say a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, it's, we tend to have just naturally as consumers, we tend to think, well, protein, isn't that like meat? Isn't that like milk? You know, you know, where, where do you get protein if you're eating like plants? Like it's almost like that's, I remember when I first, I'm not a vegan, I'm not really even a vegetarian, but I eat closer to that than I do, you know, um, eating a lot. I don't eat a very lot, a lot of animal foods. Um, and so I remember when I first, I actually did, I was vegan for a while. I was very strict, only, only all plant foods. And I remember that people would come to me and my grandmother and, you know, friends and family were like, oh my gosh, where are you getting your protein? And, you know, uh, one of the first things I would ask them is I would say, let me ask you a question. Where do cows get their protein? And they'd be like, what? I'm like, you eat cows, right? And they're like, yeah. Do you cows eat cows? And they're like, uh, no. What do cows eat? Grass. Well then how the heck do they have all that protein in their flesh? Uh, you look at the biggest, strongest animals, look at a rhino, what do they eat? Plants. Look at an elephant, what do they eat? Plants. Look at a silverback gorilla, about three times the size of man, and uh, yet they, and they have huge, they're way stronger than us, and they live on like bamboo and leaves and you know, fruits, things like this, they don't, they don't eat animal foods. So, so the idea that you have to eat an animal food in order to get protein, it doesn't even line up with common sense, let alone science. But that being said, that's why if we understand what protein is, we can get a better idea of why uh, we don't necessarily have to, and, not, and I'm not saying not to eat animal foods, but we don't necessarily have to, uh, and there may be some reasons to avoid eating a lot of animal foods and certain kinds of animal foods for just long-term health. Because remember, we're not just looking at weight loss, but long-term health, longevity as well. So when we look at how to kind of how to answer this is we have to understand that every protein that you eat, every protein food that you eat is simply a collection of amino acids. I mean, now, now there, when it comes to human consumption, there are considered to be 20 total amino acids and these are split into two categories. One is called essential amino acids, meaning you've got to eat these things on a regular basis. They're essential for health. If you don't get enough of them, then you develop some type of disease or uh, deficiency, and this, this is not good for your health. And then the second category is in what are called uh, uh, non-essential, or sometimes referred to as conditionally essential, essential, meaning that under certain conditions, like a certain illness or disease, you might need some more of these than um, you know, just normal conditions. 
Generally speaking, our body uses the nine essential amino acids and it can make all of the others, like a little chemical factory, it can make these ones on its own. So given that we provide it with the essential amino acids, our body doesn't really need these ones. They, they are in almost all foods. Uh, there are the degrees, varying degrees of amino acids in different foods. So like when you eat a carrot, you're eating amino acids because there are a whole bunch of different amino acids in a carrot. When you eat an apple, there are amino acids. When you eat a steak, there are amino acids. There are amino acids in everything. So why is it that people have kind of got this idea that we got to eat meat or you know animal foods in order to get protein? One of the reasons for this is it just so happens that animal flesh or animal products are particularly high in the essential amino acids. So they have both, but they are especially high in these ones, more so oftentimes than many plant foods. So you know it's true that if you look at an apple and you compare it to say beef, right? The, the beef will have a lot more of the essential amino acids than the apple will. The apple will have a little bit, but just not as much. So there is some truth to the fact that when you look at an animal food, it's going to have a lot more of the essential amino acids than non-essential. Now, there can be good about that and bad, as we'll see in a second. Uh, we'll come, back, come to that in a minute. Let's, let's kind of move on here. So uh, one, one little tangent here is we've already kind of defined what essential amino acids are. They are the nine essential that we need for health. And it just so happens this product I mentioned here earlier, that's why it's called essential amino acids because it has all nine of them in one product. But one thing that's missing in this product are these ones down here, the non-essential. They're not in this product or, and or if they are in a product, they're usually in very limited amount. There's not very many of them. Why would someone go out of their way to say, consume just the essential and not the non-essential? Uh, I'll come to that in a second. So um, uh, the uh, second question here we have is, what is the purpose of protein? This is another one there are a lot of myths with. Many people, I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say this. They'll be like, oh yeah, I just need a little more protein because my energy is just, I'm just a little low energy. I probably just need a little protein. Uh, they, people tend to think of protein as like, it gives me energy. It's like sort of like, uh, now I guess there's sort of a half truth to that in the sense that um, when it comes to our body producing energy, it, it does this from calories that we eat. You know, we, we produce just like putting wood in a fire, right? You got to put wood in the fire so it can burn up and, you know, use energy, right? Um, but protein is not really meant to be ideally used as a pro or an energy source. When we look in these science journals, one of the things they're going to explain is that the two fuels that our body uses almost exclusively for energy are carbohydrates and fats. Carbohydrates and fats. So when you go through the day, your body typically is using fat and carbohydrate for its energy sources. Protein only becomes an energy source in certain situations, whether it be um, you're eating too much protein or you're not eating enough protein, um, your body can begin to, you know, so for example, if I'm not eating enough calories, I'm, I'm starving, let's say, right? My body will actually use my own protein tissues, the ones I have stored on me, like my muscles, for energy. It starts gobbling them up and saying, well, geez, if you're not gonna give me any calories, I'm gonna have to eat you. And I will take your protein and I will turn it into an energy that I can use uh, on the other hand, another way we use protein is when we eat too much protein. So it's kind of coming over here for a second, but when we eat too much protein, there's actually, uh, many people will go on and on about trying to exaggerate, like, oh, if you eat too much protein, it's gonna make, damage your kidneys, or, you know, some of these things are not necessarily true, uh, only for certain, maybe certain people with certain medical conditions. But one thing that is true, this is very well established, is that whenever you eat more protein than you need for that day, your body will, de will decide to burn more protein or get rid of more protein at the expense of burning fat. So think about that. So, so we don't just burn calories at a constant rate. We, our body is adjusting what, based on what we eat. So when we eat more protein than we need, what we see happen is the oxidation of stored fat goes down. Why? Well, because the body says, well, I'll just use that energy to burn off all those extra amino acids you keep giving me that I don't need. So is there a downside to too much protein? Yeah, in some respects, if you eat more protein than you need, you actually, you don't necessarily turn that protein into fat in a significant degree, but what you do do is you down-regulate your fat burning so that your body can increase protein burning. So excess protein can actually, believe it or not, uh, make you burn less fat. And some people, you know, it's funny because a lot of people are like, well, if I just jam down more protein, I'll, I'll lose more fat. Well, remember, it's important to get enough protein, but we don't want excess protein either because that that's, can actually do more harm than good. Um, so uh, when it comes to what is the purpose of protein, which is the answer to the question, it's to repair cells. 
and uh, to basically it's a building block. It builds up things in our bodies, muscles and cells, and it has roles in other functions in our body. But primarily our body uses protein for building stuff, and it doesn't want to use it for your energy stuff. It's saying, hey, I'll use your carbs for that, and I'll use the stored fat for that, but I'm only going to use protein as an energy source if there's some other extreme going on. Uh, no, uh, letter C, how much protein do I need? This is a little trickier to answer because, um, well, for a few reasons. Number one, protein needs vary depending on what it is you're doing. Uh, so there are several factors we'd have to consider. How much physical activity do you get? Are you doing regular progressive resistance training? Are you, how, much, how many calories are you eating? Somebody who's in a very extreme caloric deficit will require more protein uh, than somebody, say, who is eating lots of calories. Uh, the more calories you eat, typically the less protein you need. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because remember that when, you're, when you eat too many calories, you're, you're already making it difficult for your body to burn fat. And if you heap a bunch of protein on top of that, um, you actually interfere with fat metabolism. Also, another thing is, is that carbohydrates, uh, carb intake, people on low carb diet versus high carb diet. So one study done by Dr. Kevin Hall looked at a high protein diet, low carb diet basically, versus a high carb diet with just, just barely enough protein. And what they found was that even on the high protein diet, many of the people who were eating low carb lost a lot of muscle during their weight loss protocol. Uh, so why was that? Well, because their bodies simply began to use the protein to produce sugar, glucose. So protein can be made into glucose when insufficient carbohydrate is present. Carbs are considered to be what they call protein sparing, meaning that if you eat enough carbs, your body doesn't need as much protein. Why? Because it uses carbs for energy, right? Remember, if we take away the carbs, yeah, you're burning more fat, but the problem is you're also now burning a lot more protein, and this can potentially reduce your muscle. And that's why many times people on low-carb diets tend to not only lose body fat, but they tend to lose some of their lean mass as well, as uh, Dr. Kevin Hall's study uh, published or, or was able to determine. Um, so other factors have to do with injury or illness. Um, believe it or not, that when you're sick or you're um, ill or you're um, injured, you have an injury, or let's say even a surgery. You notice how the doctor will almost always say after a surgery, uh, I remember when my mother had her knee replaced, the doctor was right away, but watch you on a high protein diet for a, at least a short period of time. Why is that? Well, when you eat protein, it actually can amp up uh, muscular repair and even boost immune function. So, if you, so in other words, one reason we don't want too low protein is too low protein interferes with our immune function, our immune system. Um, so we want to have adequate protein to help have proper immune function. Um, and uh, to help with repair or injury. So if you get an injury, I mean, whether it be, a, you know, I, I, sometimes if I have muscle soreness or I've had a cut or some, any type of injury, I might try to purposely amp up my protein for a little bit for maybe a few days just to try to speed up that process a little bit. And what happens when you boost protein is you see hormones go up and, and processes go up that, that have to do with cellular repair. So for example, one of them is called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. And this is a hormone that elevates in response to protein feedings that can actually boost immune function and muscle repair. Now the problem is, we see that high IGF-1, however, on the flip side, so if someone has excess IGF-1, meaning they eat tons of protein, can be a downside because what we see is that cellular repair processes speed up, but so does cell division. So meaning that the person's literally aging faster. Cells are dividing more rapidly and it can even be linked now to uh, cancer. So we know one of the few groups of people on the planet that don't ever get cancer. Strangely enough, they have a disorder where their liver cannot convert protein very efficiently into IGF-1. So they have very low levels of IGF-1 and subsequently they're like pretty much immune from getting cancer. It's like not a single documented person. They also have extremely low rates of diabetes and many other health conditions despite not eating super healthy diets. And this is because uh, scientists believe they have such low levels of IGF-1. And we know that diets that are lower in protein typically produce less IGF-1, and this can potentially be a longevity uh, trigger, meaning we could actually live longer on somewhat lower protein diets. So we're back to this issue of like, we want enough protein, but we don't want excessive protein. Um, so there are a lot of other factors, age, how old are you, um, uh, do you have any existing health issues? So strangely enough, another big surprise for many people, many people think that young people need more protein and then older people need less protein. But strangely enough, it's the flip. 
When you get over 65, people over 65 require more protein than young people do. And so um, this is kind of unfortunate because many older people have a hard time getting enough protein. And young people are jamming down protein products and stuff like crazy, right? And this can, this can be oftentimes do more harm than good. D, can I eat too much protein? We kind of touched on this a little bit already, but let me just touch on a few other little things. One, one of the issues with excess protein that many people just don't stop to think about, sometimes they run into people who just push protein, push protein, push protein, and they do so at the expense of other things that are probably way more important for health. Uh, now, there are good things about protein. Protein can contribute to satiety, it can contribute to weight loss, you know, those are all good things. But the problem is, is this, what's called this displacement model, meaning that when you eat too much of one thing, what are you eating less of somewhere else, right? Because when you jam your whole day full of protein, what are you eating less of? Fruits and vegetables, things that typically might be lower in protein, but contain substances that are far more protective and maybe even contribute to greater weight loss than just tons and tons of protein, right? So a lot of times you have people on these low carb, high protein diets, and then what, they're not eating any fruits, they're not eating vegetables, they're not eating any whole grains. And so they're missing out on all these protective nutrients because unfortunately, protein foods, don't typically come with a lot of antioxidants, phytochemicals, and nutrients like that. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, most people when they do eat protein foods, they're either eating something very refined, like a protein powder, or they're eating a animal food that is, that is um, uh, you know, lower in nutrients. Part of the lower nutrient profile is not just because that food is low nutrient, but because it has to be cooked. So remember, when you eat protein foods, how many of them are you eating raw? You know, you eat raw steak or you eating raw eggs. No, you're eating these things cooked. Now, it, it can actually, strange enough, it can boost your absorption of the protein, but it reduces and or, uh, so it reduces the antioxidants in those foods and even forms more dangerous ones. So when you cook a protein at high temperatures, such as like say meat over an open grill, now you're producing things like uh, heterocyclic amines, aromatic hydrocarbons, benzopyrene, acrylamide, these are, carcinogens that can actually damage cells and contribute to gene mutation and you know damage the DNA and so on. So high protein diet by default is a high cooked diet. High cooked diet by default tends to be a low antioxidant diet. And so we wanna to try to not displace other things that are really important. Another, another thing um, is microbiome studies. What gut health. We know that when you can just go, just do a search, do a Google search, type in microbiome health, high protein diet versus high carb diet. And what you're gonna see is the, the microbiome that is considered, or sometimes called the enterotype, that's most considered with health and longevity is the high carb diet. The high protein diet is the one most associated with mortality. Higher cancer risk, higher diabetes risk. A study done at Duke University found that people on high protein diets were at a higher risk of developing type two diabetes. And they contributed this not only to the sugar intake, but excess amino acid intake. Um, so we can see also in longevity studies, I mentioned earlier, one of the most effective means of lengthening the lifespan of animals is to simply reduce their protein intake. So again, we're back to like, are you just trying to build big muscles and you know, um, uh, look real lean? One of the books I read in class a few months ago that the researcher uh, Panzer mentioned, he said when we looked at animals on high protein diets, he said they made really sexy corpses. Meaning he was saying they looked really good, but they were dead, they, they died much younger. Whereas the, an the animals that were on adequate protein, but high carb, coming from whole foods, they, lit, they looked good and they lived way longer. So he's saying the secret to success for health and longevity is not super low protein or super high protein, it's getting adequate protein with sufficient fiber and carbohydrate. So we don't, we don't wanna cut the carbs out. Um, lastly, best sources, I'm gonna skip over this part here, uh, best sources. I already mentioned we want, ideally we can get raw foods, so get a lot of those amino acids raw, and they can come from uh, a lot of plants. Now the best source, of, strangely enough, this is another surpriser, is um, one of the highest sources of quality protein that's raw are dark leafy greens. Many people don't realize that like your, your spinach and your kale and your Swiss chard, these things are loaded with protein, and calorie for calorie, if you compare them to beef, they have almost the exact same amount of protein, calorie for calorie. The only downside is you have to eat a lot more of them. You know, you eat one little chunk of beef and you get a lot of protein, but you, eat, you have to eat a lot of greens in order to get, you know, uh, the same number of calories. Um, so you don't want to get all your protein from there, but vegetables are great. Beans, legumes, um, soy, man, almost everybody knows soybeans are loaded with protein, and they come with a lot of other benefits. Plant proteins, um, we see almost every major health organization says, decrease your animal consumption, increase plant consumption. Not necessarily just because animal foods are bad and plants are good, but because most people are eating too many animals and not enough plants. 
So we want to encourage people to try to eat more plants. And plant proteins come with all the benefits that are often missing in the animal foods. The higher fiber content, the phytochemicals, vitamins, and so on. So we want to, we want to consume more plant sources of protein. Um, and then when we do eat animal sources, be selective. Choose ones that are lean, that are lower in saturated fat, cholesterol, that aren't cooked at crazy high temperatures. One of the safest ways to cook animal proteins is in water with vegetables. So think like soups and stews are great ways to cook animal proteins. Uh, remember, part of the problem with animal proteins might not just be the protein itself, but it tends to be bonded to some of the things that we know are harmful for health, like those saturated fats, the high cholesterol, things like that. So that, 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 that could be part of the issue. Lastly, EAAs, why am I answering this question? Why do I like EAAs? Well, one of the reasons I like it is because, one, EAAs contain only the essential amino acids, and it allows people who are trying to eat more plant-based diets to get enough protein, but not overconsume the non-essential amino acids. When you overconsume the non-essential amino acids, remember, those are the ones your body's got to burn at the expense of fat oxidation. So if I wanted to say eat more plant-based diet, but I also want to be like, well, I also want to make sure I get enough protein, rather than jamming down scoops of protein powder and eating steaks and things like this, I can, um, I can add in some essential amino acids and I can just sort of, I can add it to a plant-based meal and I know that in that uh, essential amino acid scoop, I'm getting akin to what would be a, almost like eating a steak. Uh, this is a quote from the uh, International Journal of Sports Medicine and they talk about the importance of making sure that when you're, if you're trying to build muscle and you're trying to get you know, sufficient protein, they said that what we want are what they call acute doses. And acute means like all at once, so to speak, right? You know, in the, in the meal of roughly 700 to 3,000 grams, I'm sorry, milligrams of, um, no, grams, no, milligrams, milligrams. So it'd be three grams or 3,000 milligrams of leucine per meal. Leucine is just one of the amino acids and it tends to be particularly high in the essential amino acids. This particular product, for, just to give an example, has three grams of leucine per scoop. So I know if I did one scoop of this and I added it to a meal, I'm like worried at that upper threshold of leucine. Why leucine? Well, because it just happens to be one of the amino acids that's particularly responsible for building muscle. So I like this because I'm like, man, I know if I do one scoop of this, I'm gonna get like a really good whopping dose of all the essential amino acids but I'm not getting all of these ones down here, so I don't need to sort of rob Peter to pay Paul. My body's like, hey, you gave me what I wanted, and you didn't give me all the excess stuff, so I can just kind of focus on you know, burning off fat at the same rate and not have to be focusing on burning off those surplus amino acids. EAA is also an advantage that rather than like a, a shake, like a big, thick, you know, you know, sometimes the protein powders are great if you want that shake, dynamic, but sometimes people are like, I just don't feel like a shake. I just want to drink some water with my meal. The nice thing about EAAs is rather than being thick and sludgy, it dissolves in water like a glass of lemonade. So I can throw a scoop of this in a bottle of water and just kind of drink it and I can put some ice in it and it just tastes like I'm drinking a jug of lemonade. So I like that convenience factor. And then also digestion. Unlike a lot of other proteins that can be gassy and cause bloating, EAAs have been shown to be digested much more easily and readily than protein powders and other protein foods. So if someone has digestive problems, um, then EAAs can be a great uh, alternative. I'll, I'll end with, I always want to, I always you know, end with this to say, why whenever I you know, say something about a supplement, I still always want to say whole foods are always best. Um, I tend to think this is somebody great for somebody who's doing more plant-based diet and it's also lifting weights and wants to build some muscle. That in that context, I think EAAs can be a great addition. That's it.